Section 11. Constitution, Condition, and Ultimate Destruction of the Earth by Fire. Chemical analysis proves to us the important fact that the great bulk of the earth, meaning thereby the land, as distinct from the waters, is composed of metallic oxides or metals in combination with oxygen. When means are adopted to remove the oxygen, it is found that most of these metallic bases are highly combustible. The different degrees of affinity existing among the elements of the earth give rise to all the rocks, minerals, ores, deposits, and strata which constitute the material habitable world. The different specific gravities or relative densities which these substances are found to possess and the numerous evidences which exist of their former plastic or semi-fluid condition afford positive proof that from a once commingled or chaotic state regular but rapid precipitation, stratification, crystallization, and concrete successively occurred, and that in some way not yet clear to us sufficient chemical action was produced to ignite a great portion of the earth and to reduce it to a molten incandescent state, the volatile products of which being forcibly eliminated have broken up the stratified formations and produced the irregular confusion condition which we now observe. That such the incandescent molten state of a great portion of the lower parts of the earth still exists is a matter of certainty, and there is evidence that the heat thus internally generated by is gradually increasing. Quote, the uppermost strata of the soil share in all variations of temperature which depend upon the seasons, and this influence is exerted to a depth which, although it varies with the latitude, is never very great. Beyond this point, the temperature rises in proportion as we descend in greater depths, and it has been shown by numerous and often repeated experiments that the increase of temperature is on average one degree Fahrenheit for about every 545 feet. Hence it results that at a depth of about 12 miles from the surface, we should be on the verge of an incandescent mass, end quote. These quotes are taken from Rambles of a Naturalist by M. D. Quatrefrage. Quote, so great is the heat within the earth that in Switzerland and other countries where the springs of water are very deep, they bring to the surface the warm mineral waters so much used for baths and medicine for the sick. And it is said that if you were to dig up very deep down into the earth, the temperature would increase at the rate of one degree of the thermometer for every hundred feet, so that at the depth of seven thousand feet, or one half, one mile and a half, all the water that you found would be boiling. And at the depth of about ten miles, all the rocks would be melted. A day will yet come when this earth will be burned up by the fire. There is fire, as you have heard, within it ready to burst forth at any moment, end quote. quote. This earth, although covered all round with a solid crust, is all on fire within. Its interior is supposed to be a burning mass of melted glowing metals, fiery gas, and boiling lava. Note, the solid crust which covers this inward fire is supposed not to be much more than from 9 to 12 miles in thickness. Whenever this crust breaks open or is cleft in any place, there rush out lava, fire, melted rocks, fiery gases, and ashes, sometimes in such floods as to bury whole cities. From time to time we read of the earth quaking, trembling, and sometimes opening, and of mountains and small islands, which are mountains in the sea, quotes coming from The World's Birthday by Professor Gossett, Geneva, page 43 and sometimes opening in of mountains and small islands, which are mountains in the sea, being thrown up in a day, end quote. In a periodical called, quote, Recreative Science, end quote, at the end of an interesting article on volcanoes, etc., the following sentence occurs, quote, The conclusion is therefore inevitable that the general distribution all over the earth of volcanic vents their similarity of action and products, their enormous power and in seeming inexhaustibility, their extensiveness of action in their respective sites, the continuance of their energies during countless years, and the incessant burning day and night from year to year of such craters as Stromboli, and lastly, the apparent inefficiency of external circumstances in controlling their operations, 
Eruptions happening beneath the sea as beneath the land, in the frigid as the torrid zone. For these and many less striking phenomena we must seek for some great and general cause, such only as the central heat of the earth affords us. End quote. Sir Richard Phillips says, quote, At the depth of 50 feet from the sea level, the temperature of the earth is the same winter and summer. End quote. Quote, the deepest coal mine in England is at Killingsworth near Newcastle upon Tyne, and the mean annual temperature at 400 yards below the surface is 77 degrees, and at 300 yards, 70 degrees. These quotes coming from the world's birthday, Professor Gauss in Geneva, page 42. And at 300 yards, 70 degrees, while at the surface is but 48 degrees, being about one degree of increase for every 15 yards. Hence, at 3,300 yards, the heat would be equal to boiling water, taking 20 yards to a degree. This explains the origin of hot springs. The heat of the bath waters is 116 degrees, hence they would appear to rise from a depth of 1,320 yards. By experiments made at the Observatory of Paris for ascertaining the increase of temperature from the surface of the earth towards the interior, 51 feet or 17 yards corresponds to the increase of 1 degree Fahrenheit's thermometer. Hence the temperature of boiling water would be at 8,212 feet, or about one and a half English miles under Paris. End quote. Professor Silliman of America states, quote, that in boring the artesian wells in Paris, the temperature increased at the rate of one degree for every 50 feet downwards. And, reasoning from causes known to exist, the whole of the interior part of the earth, or at least a great part of it, is an ocean of melted rock agitated by violent winds, end quote. Sir Charles Lyell, in his address to the British Association, assembled at Bath, September 1864, speaking of hot springs generally said, quote, An increase of heat is always experienced as we ascend to the interior of the earth. Note, the estimate deduced by Mr. Hopkins from an accurate series of observations made in the monk Wearmouth shaft near Durham and the Dukenfield shaft near Manchester each of them 2,000 feet in depth. In these shafts, the temperature was found to rise at the rate of one degree Fahrenheit for every increase in depth from 65 to 70 feet. The observations made by M. Arago in 1821 that the deepest artesian wells are the warmest threw great light on the origin of the thermal springs and on the establishment of the law that ter terrestrial heat increases with increasing depth. It is a remarkable fact, which has but recently been noticed, that the close of the 3rd century St. Patricius, probably Bishop of Partusia, was led to adopt very correct views regarding the phenomenon of the hot springs at Carthage. On being asked what was the cause of boiling water bursting from the earth, he replied, quote, Fire is nourished in the clouds, and in the interior of the earth, as Etna and other mountains near Naples may teach you, the subterranean waters rise as if through siphons. The cause of hot springs is this. Waters which are more remote from the subterranean fire are colder, whilst those which rise nearer the fire are heated by it, and bring with them to the surface which we inhabit an supportable degree of heat. End quote. End quote. Those quotes coming from Humboldt's Cosmos, page 220. The investigations which have been made and the evidence which has been brought together render it undeniable that the lower parts of the earth are on fire. Of the intensity of the combustion no practical idea can be formed. It is fearful beyond comparison. The lava thrown out from a volcano in Mexico, quote, was so hot that it continued to smoke for twenty years, and after three years and a half a piece of wood took fire in it at a distance of five miles from the crater." End quote. In various parts of the world, large islands have been thrown up from the sea in a red-hot glowing condition, and so intensely heated that after being forced through many fathoms of salt water and standing in the midst of it, exposed to wind and rain for several months, they were not sufficiently cooled for persons to approach and standeth upon them. Quote, a notable fact is the force exerted in the volcano volcanic action, Cotopaxi in 1738 threw its fiery rockets 3,000 feet above its crater, while in 1744 the blazing mass struggled for an outlet, roared like a furnace, 
so that its awful voice was heard at a distance of more than 600 miles. In 1797, the crater of Tongaragua, one of the great peaks of the Andes, flung out torrents of mud which dammed up rivers, opened new lakes, and in valleys of a thousand feet wide made deposits 600 feet deep. The stream from Vesuvius, which in 1737 passed through Torre del Greco, contained 33 million cubic feet of solid matter, and in 1794, when Torre del Greco was destroyed a second time, the mass of lava amounted to 45 million cubic feet. In 1669, Etna poured forth a flood which covered 84 square miles of surface and measurable, measured nearly 100 million cubic feet. On this occasion, the sand and scories formed in the Monte Rosi near Nicolosi, a cone two miles in circumference and 450 feet high. The stream thrown out by Etna in 1819 was in motion at the rate of a yard per day for nine months after the eruption, and it is on record that the lavas of the same mountain after a terrible eruption were not thoroughly cooled and consolidated ten years after the event. In the eruption of Vesuvius, A.D. 79, the scories and ashes, I guess that's scoria, and ashes vomited forth far exceeded the entire bulk of the mountain, while in 1660, Etna disgorged more than 20 times its own mass. Vesuvius has thrown its ashes as far as Constantinople, Syria, and Egypt. It hurled stones eight pounds in weight to Pompeii a distance of six miles, while similar masses were tossed up 2,000 feet above its summit. Cotopaxi has projected a block 100 cubic yards in volume at a distance of nine miles, while Sambawa in 1815, during the most terrible eruption on record, sent its ashes as far as Java, a distance of 300 miles. In viewing these evidences of enormous power, we are forcibly struck with the similarity of action with which they have been associated, and carrying our investigation a step further, the same similarity of the producing power is hinted at in the identity of the materials ejected. Thus, if we classify the characteristics of all recorded eruptions, we shall find that the phenomena are all reducible to upheavals of the earth, rumblings and explosions, ejections of carbonic acid, fiery torrents of lava, cinders and mud, with accompanying thunder and lightning. The last named phenomena are extrajudicial in character. They are merely the result of the atmospheric disturbance consequent on the escape of great heat from the earth, just as the burning of an American forest causes thunder and rain. The connection that apparently exists, too, between neighboring craters is strongly confirmed by the fact that in every distinct volcanic locus, but one crater is usually active at a time. Since Vesuvius has resumed its activity, the numerous volcanic vents on the other side of the bay have sunk into comparative inactivity, for ancient writers who are silent respecting the former speak of the mephitic vapors of the lake Avernus as destructive to animal existence, and in earlier days than these, Homer pictures the Phlegrean fields as the entrance to the infernal regions, placed at the limits of the habitable world, unenlightened by rising or setting sun, and enveloped in eternal gloom. Note, the earth contains within it a mass of heated material. Nay, it is a heated and incandescent body, habitable only because surrounded with a cool crust, the crust being to it a mere shell within which the vast internal fires are securely enclosed, and yet not securely, perhaps, unless such vents existed as those to which we apply the term volcano. And note, every volcano is a safety valve ready to relieve the pressure from within when that pressure rises to a certain degree of intensity, or permanently serving for the escape of conflagrations, which, if not so provided with escape, might rend the habitable crust to pieces." End quote.
Thus it is certain from the phenomena of earthquakes, submarine and inland volcanoes which exist in every part of the earth, from the frozen to the tropical regions, hot and boiling springs, fountains of mud and steam, lakes of burning sulfur, jets and blasts of destructive gases, and the choke and fire, damps of our coal mines, that a few miles of only below the surface of the earth there exists a vast region of, these quotes were from Recreative Sciences, pages 257 to 260, of the earth there exists a vast region of combustion, the intensity and power of which are indescribable and cannot be compared with anything within the range of human experience. As the earth is an extended plain resting in upon the waters of the great deep, it may fitly be compared to a large vessel or ship floating at anchor with her hold, or lower compartments beneath the water line filled with the burning materials, and from our knowledge of, na of the nature and action of fire, it is difficult to understand in what way the combustion can be prevented from extending when it is known to be surrounded with highly inflammable substances. Wherever a fire is surrounded with heterogeneous materials, some highly combustible and others partially and indirectly combustible, it is not possible for it to remain continually in the same condition nor to diminish in extent and intensity. It must increase and extend itself. That the fire in the earth is so surrounded with inflammable materials is matter of certainty. The millions of tons of coals, peat, turf, mineral oils, rock tar, pitch, asphalt, bitumen, petroleum, mineral naphtha, and numerous other hydrocarbons which exist in various parts of the earth, and much of these far down below the surface, prove this condition to exist. The products of volcanic action being chiefly carbon in combination with hydrogen and oxygen prove also that these carbon count compounds already exist in a state of combustion and that as much immense quantities of the same fuel still exist, it is quite within the range of possibility that some of the lower strata of combustible matter may take fire and the action rapidly extend itself through the various and innumerable veins which ramify in every direction throughout the whole earth. Should such an action commence, knowing as we do, that the rocks and minerals of the earth are but oxides of inflammable bases, and that the affinities to these bases are greatly weakened and almost suspended in the presence of highly heated carbon, we see clearly that such chemical action or fire would quickly extend and increase in intensity until the whole earth with everything entering into this composition would rapidly decompose, volatize, and burst into one vast, indescribable, annihilating conflagration. End of section 11. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video presentation. If you did, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, like the video, and share it on your favorite social media sites. There's a lot more to come, so stay tuned, and we'll see you back next time.